I was assisting Ted in defending the charges against him in Utah. For the Carol Durant attempted kidnapping. He never admitted Carol Durant escaped from his Volkswagen bug. He would always focus on the legalities of it and how the lineup was unfair, the photo montage was unfair. But at the time, I was the public defender in Seattle assigned to his case, and I didn't have the authority to represent him in Utah. So I suggested he contact John O'Connell, who was a very good lawyer. And Ted, of course, never listened to him. John and I would talk on the phone about the trial because Ted was irritating him so much. I mean, Ted could burn through lawyers really fast. O'Connell thought there was so much bad pretrial publicity about Ted that he had a better chance to be in front of a judge rather than a jury. And so he decided to waive the jury. This was a big risk because if you have a jury trial, you've got 12 people who could potentially say, I have a reasonable doubt. When you have a judge, it's just one person that's making that decision. So I would only waive the jury in a case where it's very clear that my client is innocent, which you couldn't say about Ted. The victim, Carol Durant, took the stand and identified Ted as her attempted kidnapper. And so the strategy was it was a horrible mistake in identification here. Eyewitness identification is the weakest kind of evidence there is. You can explain away eyewitness testimony pretty easily because we all misidentify people all the time. Aren't you so-and-so? No, I'm not. So it was, you know, actually not a bad defense at all, except Ted, like an idiot, decided he wanted to testify. That's his right. A lawyer can't make that decision. And Ted was convinced he could charm the judge. So Ted took the stand. Against John's advice, John called me and he says, I can't believe this ass wants to testify. And that was the worst thing Ted could have done because he was caught in all these lies. Ted lied about having other license plates in his car. How can you lie about that? They're there. He lied about the ice pick and the handcuffs. They were there. So Ted was completely discredited by the prosecution. It was pathetic. The trial lasted four days. He was convicted in Utah of attempted kidnapping and then given a rather light sentence, 18 months, because the authorities knew things were cooking in Colorado. New evidence has linked Ted Bundy to the murder of Karen Campbell, who was found dead outside Aspen nearly two years ago. The police authorities claim they found a hair in Ted's Volkswagen that was seized and searched in Utah that was similar to a hair from a missing woman in Colorado. Everybody knows, including a first-year police cadet, that hair analysis is not definitive. The most you can tell from hair is race and gender. The only way you can tell any more from hair is if you have a follicle, which you could use for DNA testing. But of course, back then, they didn't have any DNA testing. That was the only physical evidence that anyone had, but it was good enough for court. Aspen police have begun extradition proceedings to bring Bundy to Colorado, where he has been charged with murder. The death penalty in Colorado had just been reinstated, so I knew I would be hearing from Ted again. I went to visit him in the Utah prison. He had just been charged with murder in Colorado, and I was assisting him on the extradition. There was a lot of eyewitness identification in Colorado, and the circumstantial evidence was mounting. I was talking about getting a psychological exam for him to convince the authorities in Utah and Colorado to release him to Washington, where he could serve his time in a mental institution rather than prison. I suggested that idea, and he ultimately rejected it. It's usually Ted would continue to play the game. I'm not guilty, I'm not guilty, I'm being framed, I'm being framed, I'm being framed. But in Utah, he no longer had that facade. He didn't say and admit that he had committed all these horrendous acts, but he no longer pretended that he didn't. And now everything was becoming more and more to clear to me that Ted was the sociopathic murderer that um, people claimed he was. And that upset me greatly. I mean, I had to compartmentalize my lawyer side and my human side, not only my human side, but somebody who'd been victimized because of the death of my girlfriend. So there was this uh, turmoil going on inside me. And the first time I really recognized that was in Utah. And it was, it was very difficult for me. I believe everybody has the presumption of innocence and requires the state to prove things beyond a reasonable doubt. But representing Ted, it was becoming an ultimate test of my belief system. 
I really think the only reason to be a lawyer is to help people. I don't think it's to make money, because I haven't made a lot of money, but I think I've helped a lot of people. I represented a National Football League player who was charged with sex offenses, and he was totally innocent, and I won in that case. And I've taken two trial over 350 cases, which is probably more than any lawyer I know. It's really hard work. You know, I've had a, a family life that hasn't been very um, normal. John's very complicated. He's brilliant, very thoughtful. He's very funny. But in a lot of ways, he's, I think he's been tortured, having handled some of these really horrific cases over many decades. There are times when I dealt with my stress in unproductive ways, drugs, alcohol. I think I dealt with it not very well. My dad, who was very, at one point, a very progressive man, said, if we're going to have a free society, there has to be defense lawyers who are the absolute best and who will stand between the citizen and the government. Then he paused and he says, I'm just sorry that it's you.